From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Good morning. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Ted Nisi filling in for Tim White, who's taking a much-deserved vacation this uh, New Year's weekend. Joining me to my left on the panel is Ian Donis. He's Rhode Island Public Radio's political reporter. And our guest for the first half this morning is John Robitaille, former top aide to Governor Don Kachiri and the Republican candidate for governor in 2010. John nearly defeated Lincoln Chafee two years ago. He's now executive in residence at the Johnson & Wales Entrepreneurship Center. Did I get the whole title right there? It. There we go. So, and uh, you're on this week both because you're a, a fine gentleman and also because well, you, you made some news last week, which is you decided you will not be running for governor in 2014. You'd been in the speculation. Why did you make that decision, John? Well, I had told my uh, friends and supporters for months that I was going to wait until after the uh, 2012 election, take a really good look at it, and uh, that, you know, then make a decision. And uh, the results for Republicans in, in this past election were not all that great, especially here in Rhode Island. Um, so I had to cut the emotion away from the logic and the analytics, if you will, of, of the opportunity to win uh, in a blue state uh, as a Republican at statewide level. And I came to the decision that um, it was going to be a long shot for someone like me. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Republican, and I am, have no intention of, of changing what I believe in and who I am in order to win an election to morph into something I'm not. Uh, but having said that, I still think that, um, you know, going forward, there will be opportunities for Republicans to, to win seats in the General Assembly. But just from my perspective, having taken a look at um, you know, the results of this last election, I believe it's just not good timing. Well, that's one of the questions I had for you. Is this mm -hmm. sort of a, you know, you, uh, you know this as well as anybody right now, what it's like to run as the Republican candidate for mm -hmm. governor in Rhode Island. Is this a sign that you just don't think there's a path to victory for a Republican in 2014? Or is it just for you personally this wasn't the right move? What's your, what's your overall view if you were advising the Republican candidate, whoever well, he it, or she is? It would depend on, on the particular candidate and, and what their positions were and what their um, reputation was, a political reputation was. Uh, if you will. But um, no, I thought for me uh, specifically, it was not, um, the odds were very short of, of, of me winning, or long, excuse me, of, of winning. Let me ask you too, you sure. mentioned the Republicans got wiped out this year. I was, I remember Joe Fleming and I sitting here in the studio mm -hmm. watching the returns come in that night and being shocked to see Republicans losing General Assembly seats. Mm -hmm. They only had 18, they lost seven of those. Uh, yep. This party has no statewide candidate office holders right now, no federal office holders. First of all, what do you what do you attribute that to, and how much do you buy the idea that the national brand is is not playing well for Republicans back here in Rhode Island? Well, I think you're, you're, it does um, point out a couple of things. One, uh, we are a blue state. Rhode Island is perhaps one of, if not the bluest of blue states. When you look at 90 percent of the General Assembly, all of the congressional de delegation, and for all intents and purposes, all statewide offices are Democrats. Um, it says that you know people vote in people who are like uh, them. So it is a blue state, and we, Republicans have to realize that it's a blue state. And, and if you're going to run as a Republican, you need to pick and choose where you run and when you run. But this last election, President Obama, I think, surprised a lot of people in that he had long coattails in this state. And when longer you look than at expected. Longer than expected. And I think more people get out to vote than were, were anticipated. There was an assumption that uh, there wasn't a lot of excitement on the Democrat side this time around, but that was a false assumption because there, there was a lot of excitement and people came out to the polls. Sean, you uh, were gaining momentum when Rhode Islanders went to the polls mm -hmm. in November 2010. You came very close to being uh, Lincoln Chafee, all, le less than four points. So why do you believe that you would be a long shot in 2014? I think that the, the demographics within this state and the recent census report that came out this past week, and I think you did a story on it, uh, Ted, um, shows that there's a continuing shift of, of, of folks in and out of this, this state. And a lot of the more moderately income folks have left, according to the, to the, the uh, demographics. And a lot of um, lower income people have come into the state. And that tells me that voting patterns will continue to shift more left of center. Um, so I'm just totally looking at this. If, if it was a, uh, a two-way race, um, I don't think a Republican has uh, a real good chance statewide in this state. If it was a f another four-way race, maybe. I'm not so sure it's going to be another four-way race. Well, it seems like moderate Ken Block is very interested in running, but let me yeah. ask you a different question. Sure. Uh, was your ability to raise money a significant part of your decision not to run in 2014? No, not at all. Um, I could have raised money. In fact, I turned down a, a lot of checks along the way in the last two years. 
Uh, in 2010, I proved that it wasn't all about the money. I mean, both Lincoln Chafee and Frank Caprio spent over $30 a vote. I spent $5 a vote. And I did get help from the National Party at the end. It was a little late, but they pumped in 600000 I think, in, in media buy. So, no, I wasn't concerned about raising money. I wasn't concerned about the um, name recognition. I just didn't like the, the numbers, the way I saw the numbers evolving. There, there's a lot of interest in the Democratic side of the ledger. Mm -hmm. Looking to 2014, Ernest Almonte is sure. in, and there's a lot of expectation that Gina Raimondo and Angel Taveras will run. How do you handicap a Democratic primary with the three of those if they do all pull the trigger on it? I think it'd be fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. There, there, there's some polling that indicates that Taveras and Raimondo run better with Republicans. Mm. Uh, how do you think that would, where would the rubber meet the road in a Democratic primary? It, it uh, still a long ways off. You know, I'm not sure. I think there's still a lot, a lot of moving pieces and parts. Um, it, you know, it, it depends. And that's not a very scientific uh, answer to your question. Well, what's, but, your, what's your gut on that? Um, I think that um, uh, Gina will, will tend to, and she looks like she's taking a path that Frank Caprio took, uh, a very conservative style Democrat. Uh, where are the votes going to go? Where are the unions going to go? Where are the more progressives going to go? Uh, they probably would go more towards Angel Tavares. That's just my thinking. And, and she could find herself in the same situation uh, Frank found himself in, trying to court the more conservative side of, of, of um, the electorate and losing. Uh, which is the ever-growing side uh, that you need to win, which is primarily There have been suggestions she, Gina Raimondo, should run as a Republican. What do you think of that idea? Um, I think she would then fall into the same situation that I'm looking at, in, you know, in terms of pure numbers, and it's tough to win as an R statewide in the state. I mean, that's, I could be wrong on that, but everything that I've looked at over the last two years, and specifically the outcome of this past election, is telling me for some time, in the future, it's going to be tough for a Republican to win. So you aren't going to run, it doesn't sound like, down the ballot. You're not looking at lieutenant governor or treasurer or something like no, that? absolutely no, not. You will not be a I'm having candidate. fun what I'm doing right now, uh, <laughs> working with young people who are optimistic uh, about their futures, trying to instill that spirit of self-reliance and entrepreneurship, which this state so badly needs. And uh, we were just talking off air about the spike in entrepreneurship. And I, um, being a, a student of history and, and economics, have always um, known that a spike in entrepreneurship is a precursor to economic recovery, and I think we're beginning to see that. And I'm excited about that. And if I can help in any way, create a better place uh, in this state, it's going to Let's be. Let's talk help. about young people. Who sure. are you looking as the future then of the Republican Party? You know, the party's not going to disappear. Who do you think are the the promising people uh, who are coming up the ranks in the party and who might have a future? Perhaps who could run for governor in your stead? You know, there, there's um, um, there's several who have run. I mean, uh, Doreen Costa uh, won re-election again. Uh, we had some young people sprinkled out throughout the state uh, running for the General Assembly. They still have to get their land legs. Uh, and I think that, that some of them, especially um, uh, Mr. Costa, who ran in, in uh, Barrington, uh, is a really bright young, uh, young Republican who I think will, will stay in the game. So, um, you know, they're coming up. There's not a lot of bench strength right now, but, you know, you never know. Um, I think uh, this, this coming season, the Republican Party will be out there recruiting uh, more people for the General Assembly, and I think primarily focusing again this year on trying to rebuild their uh, footprint in the General Assembly. How do you think the GOP should focus it, its efforts going forward, mm -hmm. though, even with it being a hostile climate here in Rodan, as you described it earlier? I think more analytics, uh, better uh, picking and choosing which districts um, there's a higher probability of winning putting as much uh, boots, many boots on the ground, as much uh, physical, fiscal resources we have to win in those seats rather than a, you know, a shotgun approach. I think we have to look How at it that How about the ground game? Isn't <coughs> one of the disadvantages for Republicans that Democrats just have a vastly superior ground game? How can Republicans do better at that? Well, there was a huge leap this past election uh, with uh, what was called the strike force. There were close to 200 volunteers that were deployed uh, across the state uh, to support different candidates. That's going to continue to grow, and I think there were, there were, other than this huge, you know, coattail effect from President Obama, I think we would have probably even picked up some seats if it hadn't been for that 10 to 12 percentage point uh, boost that most Democrats got. So uh, looking ahead to 2014, the two names I keep hearing who might run for governor on mm -hmm. the Republican uh, ticket, Alan Funk, mayor mm -hmm. of Cranston, and Brendan Doherty, mm -hmm. state police superintendent, just ran against David Cicilline and lost. Uh, how do you think they fare up as candidates, and have you promised either of them your support? Uh, I haven't promised either of them my support. Or someone else, I should say. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, um, uh, both are good men. Uh, I've considered them both friends. 
And, um, you know, I think they would have to um, really run, either of them, a, a very, very well thought through, targeted campaign and count every vote as to where they could possibly get them in order to win. It, it's not going to be easy. Um, but then again, I think both men, uh, Alan is highly thought of as a mayor. He's done some great things. Um, and Brendan has an impeccable uh, record. He's a good man. So you, you never know. And I think still two years, who knows what, Rhode Island, what kind of shape Rhode Island's going to be in. If, if the fiscal cliff happens, and I think we've already fallen off the cliff, the rest of the states are going to land on top of us, um, that um, how bad will Rhode that Island be? That is a be? grim <laughs> symbolism, yeah. How bad will Rhode Island be in 2014? And will the electorate say, okay, it's time to get a Republican, a business person in there, or somebody who's a little bit fiscally stronger? There is some, speaking of businessmen, there is some speculation that businessman Carl Waddenstein, mm -hmm. the only member of the EDC board who voted against right. the 38 Studios deal, might be a gubernatorial candidate in 2014. Do you have any sense of that? Do you see any other people who, people like Ted and I might not be thinking mm -hmm. of who could emerge as gubernatorial candidates? You know, it's, it's a really good question, Ian. Um, I haven't spoken with Carl specifically about that yet. I know he's been very active. I know that he sort of stood out as being the one uh, who opposed the 38 Studios deal. He built some cachet over that. Um, you know, there's always been talk about another business person stepping up who's got money, who could run and not have to worry about the fundraising. Uh, Carl's a good man. He's a bright guy. He gets it. But I have not heard him firsthand say that he had any interest in running. Let's pivot to, to policy. We've talked a lot about uh, politics here. There was a push this week, Brian Newberry, House Minority Leaders, mm -hmm. talking about getting rid of the sales tax. Justin Katz, uh, Center for Freedom and Prosperity, the new uh, conservative think tank, put out a paper earlier this year mm -hmm. on that. It certainly is a big, bold policy idea. Liberals, Democrats don't like it at all because they want that funding to, to go toward different programs. What do you think of that idea? Do you think that's something Republicans can get behind? Do you think it's a, a thought-out idea for, for policy? Well, it definitely would be a game-changer, but is it realistic? Um, I don't think you could go from where we are now, what, 7 percent, to, to zero. Uh, if there was a, uh, a planned effort to uh, lower it over the next 10 years or something, it might have a shot. But as you just stated, I think um, there are too many people in office right now who only look at the revenue side, the support programs and that we currently have. It would be tough, but this, this state needs a game changer. I mean, there's been also some talk about, let's have another commission to talk about economic. We've had so many commissions since I've been here, I'm gonna, you know, <laughs> gonna collapse over the weight of reading all these volumes of, of, of studies. We know what the issues are. Uh, we have a, a government that spends about $8.2 billion, uh, and that's all funds, including federal matching funds, for about a million people. We spend too much money for the size of the population we have, and it's too much of a burden on taxpayers. Look at New Hampshire. New Hampshire has about the same number of people. They have a $5 billion budget. We spend $3.2 billion more for the same number of people in a state that's about a seventh of the land mass. How do they do it? We ought to be looking at New Hampshire and try to figure out what are they doing in order to be able to provide services to their people at a lower cost. I'm not saying we have to rip services away from people, but we need to do them faster, better, and cheaper. When you announced your decision not to run in 2014, yeah. you, you said Democrats or voters in Rhode Island just don't get it in so many words, but it's been almost 20 years since we've had a Democratic governor. Are you perhaps being too bleak about the willingness of Rhode Islanders to vote for a Republican uh, gubernatorial candidate? Well, I didn't say they don't get it. Um, I just basically said the reality is, is that the, the, the Democrats the political demographic has shifted. We're, we're no longer a right of center state. We are a left of center state. And people want the programs. They want the services that government provides here. That's why a lot of people come to Rhode Island, is because we are generous. I was fact-checked during the campaign about being one of the most generous states when it comes to unemployment compensation. We are. We're number four, I think. So we become a, a very comfortable state for people in need, and that's what this state has become. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I'm just saying the reality is, is that we have a, highly, a very high cost of government and an eroding tax base and a, a number of taxpayers who are leaving to support that kind of spending. All right, we have to take a break. I want to thank our guest, John Robitaille. Happy New My Year, pleasure. John. Happy and uh, Happy joining us on the second half will be Providence Phoenix News Editor David Scharfenberg to discuss Rhode Island's political amateur hour and his provocative new cover story in the Phoenix. Stick with us on Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Ted Nisi filling in for Tim White. To my left 
Ian Donis, our uh, usual panelist here, glad to have him by my side. And we're joined now by David Scharfenberg. He's the news editor of the Providence Phoenix. And Dave, Ian and I were talking before the show, you've been really been on a roll this year. You've had some great, great uh, stories. I hope everyone's reading the Phoenix in print and online. You had redistricting, changes at the Providence Journal, and now this new story, all excellent. And uh, congratulations Thanks on that. Thanks so much. And actually, you have the job that Ian used to have, which is kind of funny. We've across right. the table. So right. uh, we'll see if Ian tries to take you out again. With <laughs> so your new story here in the, the last print edition, Let's see if we can get right in there. State House blunders. And your story identifies the biggest problem in Rhode Island politics as, quote, amateurism. I want you to start off, unpack that for people who haven't read the story yet. What do you mean by amateurism? So uh, at the end of the year, as, as Ian will recall from his time at the Phoenix, we uh, aim for some sort of, uh, uh, you know, look back, kind of a retrospective and try to pick out some sort of, you know, theme from the past year. And, and the kind of Amateur hour component really uh, leaped out at me this year. Uh, we had the kind of thunderclap of the 38 Studios uh, collapse, taxpayer-supported video game company, uh, which for me was really a symbol of kind of an amateur approach to economic development, rather than a data-driven, uh, you know, comprehensive look at where we need to go as a state. We had a, a big bet on an unproven company in a, in a high-risk sector. Uh, then come election time, we had. A, a democratic establishment that in some ways had been really discredited. I mean, you had a very unpopular congressman in David Cicilline. You had uh, a democratic legislature that had approved the 38 Studios deal, more or less. And, uh, and the folks who should be able to hold them to account, uh, Anthony Gemma, who ran against uh, Cicilline in the Democratic primary, and the Republicans uh, in, in the uh, General Assembly, uh, ran sort of amateur campaigns that were unable to uh, hold these folks to account. And as a result, we've got the same people back in power. Um, and then finally, uh, we had Lincoln Chavey's uh, kind of ill-advised appearance on the O'Reilly Factor uh, to defend his decision uh, to uh, call the State House Christmas tree a holiday tree, uh, which was kind of silly in some ways, but to me was emblematic of a governor who's been you know, very principled to his credit, but uh, has uh, not had the most professional uh, political operation. Uh, and so you, you put that all together, and you're talking about kind of a a political and, and uh, policy uh, establishment that uh, isn't perhaps serving us as, as well as we might. And, you know, we all sort of chuckle as we hear the litany there. I remember some of Anthony Gemma's press releases, very grandiose, that it right. would come out before his announcements. But uh, part of what came through in your story is the idea that this has actual real day-to-day -day consequences for, for political, economic life, civic life in Rhode Island. Absolutely. I mean, these are, these are real challenges. I, I think pretty much everyone would agree that uh, uh, economic development is the single most important thing uh, Rhode Island must pursue right now. And, uh, uh, you know, I think you look at all these sort of r reports, all the data on you know, reviewing uh, the Economic Development Corporation and our strategy, and you find time and time again that there's a lack of rigor. Uh, there's there's uh, no uh, solid examination of the data. Uh, there's no plan. There's no vision. Um, you know, perhaps that'll change, but we've been saying that for years now. Um, and uh, when that's your approach, it, it makes a difference. Some people argue that a full-time General Assembly with higher salaries, perhaps you attract a better caliber of people or more educated people. Do you think that would be a, an improvement in Rhode Island's politics? And does it have any chance of becoming reality? Um, I think the record for full-time professional legislatures is mixed. Um, uh, look uh, to our, our northerly neighbor, Massachusetts. I think you've had three straight speakers of the House under indictment. Uh, you know, uh, we had a Not similar, a panacea. Not a panacea. Um, and even from a policy perspective, um, I was uh, looking at some research suggesting that states with full-time professional legislators have, legislatures have you know, higher tax burdens, et cetera, which you know, may be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your perspective. There's an expression that people get the gov government they deserve. I think that's partially a cliche, but partially true. So what can be done to get a more responsive and more mobilized public that might exert more pressure on elected officials to operate more in the public interest? It's a good question, and I think an important one. Um, uh, I think part of it is we've got some institutional problems. I mean, we've got a Republican Party uh, that, uh, as you discussed in your previous uh, segment, uh, is in uh, is very marginal and perhaps declining. Uh, when you don't provide voters with a real choice, it's difficult for them to uh, to be engaged and to be you know kind of responsible voters. Um, you know, and I think uh, once folks do get in office, we've got some institutional problems at the legislature. I mean, even without going to a full-time professional legislature, as I write in the piece, I think there are some important things that can be done. Uh, you need a policy staff 
that has the, the expertise to really vet these big ideas that come in uh, and to kind of uh, push back a little bit against the influence of uh, a Kirk Schilling who came in with 38 Studios or, or other kind of insiders. And you don't have that. You've got a, a, a fiscal staff that's pretty well respected, but you don't have, particularly on the House side, a, a, a non-fiscal staff that can be looking at the environment and health care and these uh, issues in a professional way and uh, making sure that these citizen legislators, these part-time legislators, have all the information they need to make a good decision. We're talking about uh, David Charfenberg's uh, recent cover story on state house blunders in the uh, in the state house here with a dunce cap on the state house in Rhode Island. You talked to Gary Sass, veteran policymaker. He's seen all this up close. He had some ideas, not all of them glamorous, but some of them interesting, like uh, making sure that all the there's a job description for all the jobs and a salary classification. Talk a little about some of the low-hanging fruit you heard about reporting this. Right. Might this, fix things this, help. Is, this is sort of the uh, the detail of what I was just discussing in terms of creating a more professional staff at the legislature. Uh, for years now, he, he uh, Gary Sass, uh, chaired a, uh, a 1993 Blue Ribbon Commission that called, among other things, for you know uh, job descriptions, as you say, for the, the staffers who would be kind of researching issues that might come before the legislature. You know, career ladder. So it's not. Uh, all about political influence, that there's a, uh, a more measured way to kind of move up the ladder and, and build your expertise. Um, these are things that could be done that wouldn't be terribly costly uh, and could make a real difference in terms of, you know, kind of vetting some of these ideas. Um, you know, I, I spoke to one kind of political observer in, in writing this who, who uh, was saying that in a way the 38 Studios deal and, and Gina Raimondo's pension push were kind of the uh, opposite sides of the same coin. Uh, you had uh, a, a part-time legislature uh, uh, that wasn't examining these issues deeply. You had someone come in with a big idea and they were essentially able to roll them <laughs> and do what they wanted to do. Uh, obviously there are folks who would say that uh, uh, Gina's pension push was was good policy and was worth doing. I'm not, I'm not here to comment on that. But when you have a legislature that can't vet these ideas, um, uh, then, the, then the folks who are real professionals are going to have their way. In writing about amateurism, two of the counter examples who you point to as more professional, more pragmatic politicians are State Treasurer Gina Raimondo and Providence Mayor Angel Taveras. Mm -hmm. Something that really jumps out about them is their academic credentials. Raimondo was a uh, Rhodes Scholar, Yale Law School, Taveras went to Harvard. Is the issue in politics that we need people to be better educated in Rhode Island? I think that's part of it. You know, I, I asked uh, in talking to folks if there was some uh, uh, magic bullet in terms of uh, attracting folks uh, like that to politics. I don't think there's a great answer there. Um, I think you've got a political culture that has a reputation for uh, uh, corruption and, and incompetence, perhaps overdone, but it has that reputation nonetheless. It's not a terribly attractive destination for, uh, uh, you know, well-educated, uh, accomplished folks, um, and that's a problem. Um, but, you know, they do come along um, from time to time. Uh, I think the federal delegation Rhode Island has put forth has been pretty high quality for a number of years now. Um, uh, it can happen, uh, and it can make a real difference. Uh, you know, personnel makes a real difference. We're going to do a big pivot here to the Massachusetts U.S. Senate race, which uh, has come up just this week. We have John Kerry getting appointed to Secretary of State by President Obama. He'll probably be confirmed. And we had the first Democrat definitely throw his hat into the ring this week, veteran Congressman Ed Markey, who I believe Ian interned for many moons ago as a, as a young pup uh, learning. Long learning. time ago. We had an embedded reporter there uh, <laughs> on the inside in Congress. But I'm curious. I think that, you know, uh, we are, we're both from Massachusetts. You lived there for a long time, uh, Ian. I think Democrats have a big risk on their hands with this race, this special election probably coming up in June if Kerry is confirmed, because Scott Brown, if he decides to run, the Republican just comes off having uh, run a big campaign. He, the polls showed he was still popular at the time. And, you know, voters are kind of fatigued and not too many come out to vote. They may decide, we'll just vote that guy and we liked him anyway. What do you think, Ian? I think you make a good point, Ted. I mean, particularly in a, big, a midterm election where you don't have the coattails of President Obama, which certainly were a big boost for Elizabeth Warren in November. Uh, something that's interesting about this, I heard Warren Tolman, as a former state senator in Massachusetts, observing that Scott Brown could be the uh, a rare figure who's elected to two U.S. Senate terms without having served a full term. But 
It'll be a very hard-fought race. Ed Markey has been in Congress since 1976, has $3 million in his war chest. We'll probably see a lot of other Democrats get in. And Markey briefly ran for the U.S. Senate in 1984, pulled out, and that's when John Kerry won the seat that uh, is now becoming vacant. And, of course, not the only names we're hearing. Uh, Ted Kennedy Jr. dropped out, and Ben Affleck, sorry, ladies, won't be running, he says. But we also have uh, other congressmen. Mike Capuano think you're running. Uh, uh, Lynch is thinking of running. Stephen Lynch. Stephen Lynch. We had on the Republican side Bill Weld at least flirting with it, at least getting the Globe to write about him as a candidate. He ran against uh, John Kerry, a hard-fought Senate race. Where do you see this going, uh, Dave? I think it's uh, important uh, to look also at the Republican side of the coin here. Um, Scott Brown is popular. He's got some high uh, name recognition. But just as the Republicans uh, had a hard time here in Rhode Island this past election, so did the Republicans up in Massachusetts. Scott Brown booted from his seat uh, Richard Tassay, who was considered uh, uh, a, a, a possible victor for a congressional seat, lost as well. Um, that was a real surprise. It yeah. was. So the GOP in Massachusetts is going through its own uh, kind of crisis here. And uh, I think Brown's chances in a, uh, a non-presidential election uh, are certainly good. But uh, if he comes up short, um, you know, wither the Republican Party in Massachusetts. Markey yeah. also put out a statement sounding very much like David Cicilline in his fight with Brendan Doherty, trying to nationalize this race, talking about the NRA, the Tea Party, the oil lobby. All the time we have there, but we'll end with the wisdom of Ian Don. It's a good way to end the year because that's all the time we have this week in our last show of 2012. I want to thank David Scharfenberg for joining us. And on the first half, John Robitaille. If you missed it, you can see it on our website, WPRI.com. Tim White will be back next week, and I'll be reporting from Washington. See you next week on Newsmakers.